I think we should just start. Um, so for everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Lea Espinos Lagarido, and I'm a researcher and lecturer in American studies at the University of Wuppertal. And tonight I will be chairing the final talk in the lecture series on contingent belonging, which as you all know, uh, complements the pop-up exhibition, Hostile Terrain 94 at the University of Münster. Uh, in the past two weeks, we have already heard talks by experts from various disciplines who have shed light on the topic of contingent belonging from different angles. Um, they have pointed to overlaps, but also differences between border regimes that were and still very much are at work um, across the globe. And they have also discussed historical continuities and new developments when it comes to the treatment of migrants and refugees. Um, and although two of the experts also um, came from the field of literary and cultural studies, tonight is actually the first time that we will talk about how these issues are negotiated in a fictional text. So it's my great honor and also pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Mita Energy. Um, since 2010, Mita Energy is professor of American Studies at the Obama Institute for Transnational American Studies at Mainz University. She is a co-founder of the Center of Comparative Native and Indigenous Studies and a co-speaker of the research training group, Life Sciences, Life Writing, Boundary Experiences of Human Life Between Biomedical Explanation and Lived Experience, which is also funded by the German Research Foundation, the DFG. Um, Mita has published widely in American studies, but also in the field of post-colonial studies, and I, uh, I'm afraid I can only name a few of her many publications today. So uh, her most recent monographs include um, Ethnic Ventriloquism, Literary Minstrelsy in 19th Century American Literature from 2008, Color Me White, Naturalism and Naturalization in American Literature from 2000, uh, 2013, in which she discusses issues of naturalization and citizenship in American literature. And her latest monograph, Medical Humanities in American Studies, was published with uh, Winter University Press in 2018. And her book, Biological Humanities, is also forthcoming from Winter University Press. Um, as I said, those are only a few of her publications. Tonight, um, as you can already see, because Mita um, is already sharing her screen, she will talk about the symmetry of the companionless towards a world literature of undocumented lives in Elif Shafak's um, 10 minutes, 38 seconds in this strange world. Um, so without further ado, um, I think we should all give a round of digital applause to Mita and um, I'll uh, give the floor to her. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Leah, for, for uh, this kind introduction. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to Professor Max Stein and his team. I'm really happy to be here. I would have loved to be there in person, um, but I'm also happy that you're, um, you know, uh, that I can be here digitally. So I, I think it's a wonderful project, um, Hostile Terrain on 94. And I think, you know, as I'll try to say, um, I think it's more important than ever. Um, and so, so I, since I can't see many of you, uh, if you're about to fall asleep, uh, just give me a sign. Um, and Leah is going to stop me if I go on um, too long. So um, I want to start with actually a traffic sign. And this is a sign that until very recently could be found, you know, in California near the freeway. Um, and I, you know, obviously the sign warns motorists of, you know, migrants who run across the freeway on foot. Um, and I want to ask in this paper or in this talk, you know, is the really is the sign really as straightforward as it seems, or is it actually really complicated in the message it tells? So, so at first, it seems that the sign A is directed just as at drivers, right? It warns them against migrant against migrants who have now become traffic hazards. But I think actually there's a covert message that is actually um, directed at migrants themselves. Because I think what it says is that if you are a migrant, if you run across the freeway on foot, um, basically if you get killed, you know, you're crossing the freeway at your own risk. So if you get killed, nobody will mourn you when you're dead because essentially you have now become a traffic hazard. So I would argue that actually the politics of mourning are at the heart of um, the sign, and I'll explain uh, what I mean by that in a second. 
And so Judith Butler in her book, Antigone's Claim, has said that we actually police our borders by creating two kinds of people. You know, people whose lives we can mourn, you know, when they die, and other people whose lives we cannot mourn, or we're even prohibited from mourning. So I think that these politics of mourning are actually at the heart of this sign, because it says if you become a traffic hazard, if you turn yourself into potential roadkill, you do so at your own risk. So my talk is very much about burial politics, and it's very much indebted to Katya Zakowski's and Markus Janka's current project on Antigone and the politics of burial. So I would argue that the discourse of the sign is actually deeply flawed because it elides what has come before the sign. It elides migrant biographies because basically we would have to ask, you know, what has happened? You know, what circumstances are so adverse that actually running across the freeway on foot seems the lesser risk, okay? So we have to read the sign backwards and say, you know, what were the circumstances that migrants were running from? And Jason De Leon, who you've heard, uh, I think, um, last time, you know, he says that this whole discourse of on migration is flawed because we're talking about border policing. We're not talking about migrant biographies. So I want to ask, you know, how do we resist this discourse of border policing? And how do we create an alternative politics of mourning? Because the sign, you know, because it's a traffic sign, usually traffic signs warn us against traffic hazards and roadkill. So if you are a driver and you kill a deer accidentally, you're going to be sorry, but there's not going to be a reason for mourning, you know. Um, so this is really what the sign says about migration by telling migrants you're going to cross the, you know, this freeway at your own risk, and nobody's going to mourn you. Um, you know, when you get run over. So the sign, I'm happy to say, has become obsolete for two reasons, um, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So the last of these signs was taken down in 2019, um, and it got obsolete for two reasons. First, as you see in the picture, you know, the authority just, um, authorities created, created a fence, so there's literally no need for the sign. But the second reason, for its obsolescence. For me, it's much more intriguing because studies found that motorists actually found the sign difficult to process, okay? And psychologists tell us that whenever there's two contradictory messages, you know, when th there's two messages, but they're at odds with one another, then our brains actually cannot process these messages. So actually, I wanna argue that by refusing or being unable to process the sign, motorists may actually have sort of picked up on, you know, in spite of themselves, um, against the fact that the discourse of the sign is deeply flawed. Namely, a human being can never be roadkill, okay? It's a human being. So actually the discourse of the sign of conflating migration and traffic hazards backfired, okay? So this is why the sign has now become obsolete. So I think this sign is very much part of, uh, you know, what Jason De Leon calls a prevention through deterrence. And I think the sign actually, this traffic sign in California is very similar to the signs that can also be found in the Arizona desert. And this, you know, uh, sign that I have in the bottom, you know, actually has very much the same discourse of prevention through deterrence. This sign is also directed at people who travel in the desert. It's, it's again, not directed at migrants, but it tells you know people as you're traveling in the desert, watch out for illegal migrant activity. But here too, I would say covertly, this sign is actually also directed at migrants because it says, if you're going to cross the desert, you're going to do so at your own risk, okay? Nobody's going to mourn you if you don't make it across. So Jason De Leon says, you know, there's two, you know, mandates for us when we look at these signs. First, we have to reconstruct the biographies, the lives that came before the sign, okay? And that, you know, forced people that, you know, people were so desperate that they were willing to take the risk. Second, he says, we have to mourn those who do not make it across, okay? So if the state says, 
you know, there's no possibility of mourning. We have to resist that and we have to create alternative ways of mourning. And, but he says, you know, what possibilities do we have for these alternative protocols for mourning? And he says that all we have are actually objects, okay? We can only look at the objects that migrants leave behind. So in this sense, you know, say a water bottle or a blanket, you know, or a backpack, these objects are never neutral, but they're actually, you know, very eloquent in the stories that they might tell. So each water bottle, you know, could be a sign of a story of successful crossing for somebody that has made it across the desert. But it could also be, you know, the sign of somebody who has not made it across, okay? And he said, you know, how do we actually tell these stories if the water bottle is all that we have? So we have to actually speculate um, about what happened to the migrants. And I'm gonna say more about this um, in a second. So he says that we have to honor the objects um, because they actually tell very complex stories. And second, we have to actually resist of state politics that punishes migrants even beyond their death. Okay, because as I'll show in a second, um, you know, basically the prevention through deterrence says, you know, you're going to pun be punished by the fact that you die if you don't make it across, but also by the fact that nobody is going to mourn you. Okay. Um, okay. Part two. I have five parts, but most of them are very short. So I want to shift um, from the Arizona desert to Turkey, um, to Elif Shafak's most recent novel. Uh, that I'm going to tell you about in a second. But I want to argue two things. One is I think that the idea of prevention through deterrence is actually a transnational idea. Okay, so all our all our states come up with very specific, you know, discourses of you know prevention through deterrence, but I think the overall paradigm is really the same. Second, I want to ask in how far is this prevention or, um, you know, um, true deterrence true, not just for the policing of external borders, of state borders, but also of internal, you know, boundaries between what is seen as legitimate and what is seen as illegitimate. Um, and I think, you know, coming back to Judith Butler, you know, that we know, you know, which community we're in by asking this question, you know, whose lives do we mourn? And whose lives do we not mourn? Or whose lives do, are we even prohibited um, from mourning? Okay. So the punishment, the ultimate punishment, is that actually you punish the dead by robbing them even of a decent burial. Okay. So that for both the person who died, but also for their loved ones, becomes the ultimate punishment. Um, and then the question is um, that actually both Jason de Leon and Elif Shafak ask, how do we restore the dignity of the dead? And this is where I turn to Elif Shafak's novel, uh, which has a beautiful cover, as Mark pointed out a couple of minutes ago. Um, the novel is strangely called 10 minutes and 38 seconds in the strange uh, land, in the strange world. And actually, you know, it's a novel that starts with an impossible narrative perspective because the protagonist who's telling the story you know, when she's, when the story opens, is already dead, okay? So she's already, you know, she's dead, but she's telling her story. And Elif Shafak has said in interviews that, you know, what got her started in the story was that she found that neuroscientists had found in research that when you're already dead, your brain may still be active for up to 10 minutes, which is actually a very long time. So she says, you know, in, when you're already dead, but your brain is still alive, in these last 10 minutes of your life, what would you think about? So this is um, the question she asks. So this story is being told by a woman, uh, a prostitute. Her name is Leila, Tequila Leila. She likes tequila and she calls herself Tequila Leila in defiance of, you know, whatever um, mainstream Turkey thinks of as moral. And she's just been murdered as the story opens by religious fanatics, okay? And so this is what she thinks, you know, when the story opens. See, now I have never in a thousand years would she agree to be spoken of in the past tense. The very thought of it would make her feel small and defeated 
and the last thing she wanted in this world was to feel that way. No, she would insist on the present tense, even though she now realized with a sinking feeling that her heart had just stopped beating and her breathing had abruptly ceased. And whichever way she looked at her situation, there was no denying that she was dead. And so, you know, as you see, this is an impossible narrative perspective. For some reason, I've actually gotten rid of the images, so I can't see you, but uh, I hope you hear me. Um, so this is an impossible narrative perspective because she's dead, but it's also an impossible narrative situation because as Leila is narrating this, she's actually lying in a garbage dump because the religious fanatics who have just killed her they left her body on the garbage as a deterrent sign. So this is very much part of the prevention through deterrence because they're gonna say, you know, Leila crossed this border into illegitimacy at her own risk. So now they're going to punish her beyond death by not even giving her a proper burial. Okay, so the ultimate, you know, punishment is that even in death, you're going to be a deterrent sign. Okay. So, you know, the point that the narrative makes, though, is that this is a punishment beyond death, that you rob the dead even of their dignity, even in death, okay? They're not giving a proper burial. But what Shafak says is that this is actually not just the work of religious fanatics, but it's actually the state is deeply complicit in this, okay? Because she says, you know, what happens to Leila is actually a twofold sacrilege. Um, and, and in, you know, so two things are actually completely unethical in what happens to Leila. First, there's no investigation of Leila's murder. Um, and Shafaka said in interviews that, you know, she's looked at statistics, you know, of prostitutes being murdered in Istanbul every day. Um, and very few of these murders are actually investigated. So the state is actually complicit in saying, you know, we don't care basically what happens to these prostitutes. So some lives cannot be mourned, okay? Second, to make matters worse, even the state is complicit in punishing Leila beyond the grave because she's not given a proper burial, um, you know, in a regular cemetery, but her body is taken to what is called in the novel, the cemetery of the companions. So these are unnamed graves, okay? There's, there's numbers, not names. And basically the state just dumps Leila's body there. Uh, to be forgotten, okay? So even her memory is being erased. And the space that uh, Shafak's novel creates in the cemetery of the companionists is that she says all the outcasts of society lie buried there, you know, in unnamed graves. So these are transgender men and women, prostitutes, suicides, but also undocumented migrants, okay? So these are the lives that the state, A, refuses to mourn but even prohibits others from mourning. So the question is, how do we then restore the dignity of the dead? So Jason de Leon says, there's two ethical mandates for us. We have to do two things. First, we have to reconstruct migrant lives. Okay, so um, we have to ask, you know, before the signs set in, um, you know, where, what were they running from? Okay, what made them cross the border at their own peril? Second, he says, you know, where these lives have been ended uh, through violence, um, how do we restore the dignity of the dead? So for me, I want to claim that Shafak's novel actually does both these things. First, she reconstructs Leila's life. So we learn that she became a prostitute only because as a child, she had been raped by a cousin. And then when she got pregnant, you know, her father not only condoned this rape, but he suggested that, you know, she simply got married to her cousin, right? So she was going to have to get married to her rapist. And, you know, she had to escape from that. So becoming a prostitute seemed to be, you know, the lesser risk, okay? So apparently the circumstances that she was running from were so adverse that that was her only solution. So then, you know, now that the state has put her body on the cemetery of the companionists, the question is how would we restore 
uh, the dignity of, you know, Leila's dignity even in this position. And what Shafak does is that she creates a beautiful image because she says not only how do we restore the dignity of the dead, but who would restore that dignity? And she creates the wonderful image, I think, of what she calls a water family. So she says, you know, she's of course, she says her friends are Leila's true family and they are her water family. So she's of course punning on the idea that blood is thicker than water. But she says actually the, the you know, uh, the opposite is true because actually water is thicker than blood because, you know, Leila's friends, they are her true kin, okay? Because her biological family forced her into prostitution in the first place. So her friends are actually what you might call a motley crew of outcasts, okay? So we have Nostalgia Nelan, who's a transgender woman, and, and she's happy about the fact that she transitioned, but she's also nostalgic for the stability of her old life. Then you have Hollywood Humera, who's a, a slightly overweight singer who lives in the make-believe of Hollywood film. You have Zainab 122, who's disabled, and she's also deeply religious. She's actually a migrant from Lebanon. You have Sabotage Sinan. I love their names. Uh, this is an ap apothecary's son who sabotaged his own middle-class life because all his life he's been secretly in love with Leila. And then you have Jamila, who's an undocumented migrant from Africa. And in Africa, she was shunned because her parents were of two different confessions. Her mother was Christian, her father was Muslim. So she had to escape actually um, from religious prosecution because she actually, um, in line with the title of your lecture series, you know, didn't belong anywhere. So these are, you know, this, this water family are people that don't belong, that are outcasts of society. And the German title, you know, incidentally of Schiffer's novel in, in translation in German is Unerhörte Stimmen, right? So these are voices that are unheard, unheard of, but also outrageous, okay? All of those people have crossed the boundary into what is actually illegal, immoral, and so on. But they are actually, and that's the point that the story makes, they're more ethical than any biological kin or the state. So, oh, this is what she says. Okay, I love the passage, so I'm gonna, you know, quote it. So she, Layla is still narrating from the grave, and this is what she said. She'd never told her friends this, but they were her safety net. On days when she wallowed in self-pity, her chest cracking open, they would gently pull her up and breathe life into her lungs. So these friends now find themselves in an impossible situation because Layla has been taken to the cemetery of the companionless, but they want to give Layla, their friend, a decent burial. But if they wanna do that, that means they're going to have to disinter her body, okay? They have to dig her body back out, which is of course a sacrilege. So they find themselves torn uh, and they keep trying to claim her body, following her body actually um, from, the garbage dump to the coroner's office and they keep wanting to claim the body but authorities keep telling them that you know they're not biological kin so they don't have the right to claim her body okay so um you know but the point that the the, the novel makes is actually it's not the friends who are unethical because they're even thinking of digging Leila's body back out but what is unethical is actually the state that creates a cemetery of the companionless in the first place, okay? And the novel makes the point that, you know, these people who lie there, who have been punished by being buried on the cemetery of the companionless, they're actually not companionless. It's just that the state will not recognize the people who are her companions, okay? So then the friends, you know, are, you know, stuck in this dilemma. If they dig Leila's body back out, that's unethical. But actually leaving her to rot in the cemetery of the companionless is also unethical. So their solution is that they actually disinter Leila's body, but all the while Zainab is praying over them. You know, she's reciting verses from the Quran to ward off bad luck, both, you know, from Leila 
and from the friends themselves. And so in this bizarre ethical dilemma, when they're you know, digging with shovels and axes, the novel changes style and becomes almost slapstick. So this is what the friends do. Carefully, they place their friend's body in the wheelbarrow. Nalan held the torso in place, balancing it against her legs. Fired with a new sense of purpose, she pushed the wheelbarrow forward. Dragging their tired feet and carrying their tools, the group marched towards the truck, back the way they had come. So this is actually a sacrilegious act. You know, you're not supposed to disinter bodies from the ground. But the way it's portrayed is that this disinterring becomes the only legitimate act of burial. Okay, so the friends put her in the wheelbarrow, then, you know, on the back of a pickup truck, they race the police across town because, of course, they have been speeding. And eventually, they dump Leila's body, you know, they, they throw Leila's body into the Bosporus, where she can finally rest in peace. So Shafak's novel argues that because the state has created in an unethical institution, the cemetery of the companionless, the friends actually have to create alternative ways of mourning. And they have to make, you know, invent, invent makeshift ways, improvised ways of restoring the dignity of the dead. So the state has actually vacated its own place because it's the state that is so supposed to mourn all the people that lie, you know, that, that die um, in its jurisdiction. But, you know, as Butler says, the state actually says there's some lives that we're going to mourn and others we're not going to mourn. So then the question becomes, how do we become surrogate mourners? Okay. And this is my third part. And from now on, the parts are going to be very short. So there's actually a real life model to the cemetery of the companionless that Shafak talks about. And this is a cemetery that outside, you know, on the outskirts of Istanbul, uh, that in Turkish, you know, used to be called traitor cemetery. So uh, this is a cemetery that was erected after the failed coup of 2016. And the idea was to punish the so-called traitors even beyond their own death, okay? So that was the ultimate punishment to lie there in unnamed graves. And, um, you know, prevention through deterrence very much also at the heart of the cemetery. And Kadir Topaz, who was then a mayor of Istanbul said this, on our cemeteries, there's no place for traitors. They need their own ceremony so that they can be cursed by whoever passes by. They're already in hell. This is our belief. And I wanted to show you a short clip um, that was taken just you know, after the cemetery had been created. Even the dead won't escape Turkey's purge. The sign reads traitors cemetery. Only one body lies here thus far, but three more graves are ready. Just looking at this sign gives you chills. Not just Turkey, but nowhere in the world has ever seen a sign like this. This means our authorities, our government thinks that this is what they deserved. The site lies on the outskirts of Istanbul. It's not yet open to the public, but the city's mayor has said that when it is, he hopes that every passerby curse those who lie there and let them not rest in their tombs. Nearby is a shelter for some of Istanbul's many stray dogs. They shouldn't be placed near our dogs. They shouldn't be anywhere in Turkey. They should be cremated and their ashes tossed into the ocean. The government has also issued a directive denying the alleged coup plotters funeral rights. Amnesty International has condemned such moves. Such moves are contributing to what is a pretty poisonous atmosphere and a dangerous atmosphere. Denying people religious services and decent burial is a basic denial of people's rights. It's all part of a crackdown that's already seen around 16,000 people detained. But that hasn't halted the support for Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, which right now is sky high.
even the day. So, but I'm happy to say that ultimately Erdogan's policy backfired, okay, because even his supporters said that man has no right to punish the dead even beyond their own death. That's a right that is only the prerogative of God. So ultimately, there was such resistance to the traitor cemetery that the cemetery had to be closed. Okay, I hope we're still good. Okay, 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 yes. Um, so ultimately, the cemetery had to be closed. So Shafak's novel actually creates a memory of this so-called traitor cemetery after the, the cemetery itself has already been demolished, okay? And she does two things. One is she actually renames the cemetery from cemetery, you know, traitor cemetery to cemetery of the companionless. So, so she, in a way, takes the inhuman edge of the cemetery. And she says what is shameful is not, you know, the bodies that have to lie there, but the state that creates such an institution in the first place. So second, she creates in her novel, I would argue, a site for remembering the dead, even after this inhuman cemetery has already been removed. And you know, in the media coverage um, surrounding this um, cemetery of the companionless, you know, there's a father and he was telling his son's story. And he says at the time of the coup, you know, his son was a civil servant. He was a teacher. He was taken in by the police for questioning and he died under torture. And he was then taken to the cemetery, you know, of the companionless. And the father says, you know, not only was his son punished beyond death, but he himself had no sight for mourning his son. Okay, so he didn't even know where they had taken him. So Shafak creates a monument, both for those, you know, whose lives could not be mourned, but also for the inhumaneness of the state that created such a cemetery in the first place. So I think, you know, Shafak's novel, we could say, becomes a form of literary archaeology because she, you know, she tells a story that could, could well have happened, you know, on this cemetery. So I want to ask, though, in all of this, what is the role of the reader? Okay. Um, what is our role as we look? at all these signs, you know, marking the border between what can be mourned and what cannot be mourned. So, so far, I've talked about three signs, right? The sign on the California freeway, the sign on the, you know, California, you know, Arizona desert, but also the sign marking the cemetery of the companions. And I think all of these signs want to enlist us into the idea of border policing. So they want to make us complicit in the idea that there's some lives that we cannot mourn, that we're even prohibited from mourning. And so I think we have to resist this idea that you know, we're complicit, okay? So we have to restore the lives and the biography, uh, biographies of these people. So I would actually say, if you take the idea of the cemetery of the companionless, we have to become their companions. So we have to become the surrogate mourners just as Leila's friends become the mourners, you know, her water family that was not even allowed to mourn her. Um, yes, so I think, you know, we have to resist the politics of the sign. Part four, and this is my life, last part. So, you know, Jason Leon has said that in this idea of reconstructing those, you know, the lives of those who did not make it across the border, you know, he needs forensic science. So I want to ask, in how far does literature itself also become a form of forensic science? Because Shafak talks about these lives. Of course, Leila is a fictional character, but this cemetery of the companionless was a real space, okay? So she fictionalizes characters, she fictionalizes people, you know, who could have been buried you know, in this so-called traitor cemetery. Um, and De Leon says, and I think it's the same with Shafak, because the state has prohibited us from mourning these lives and these bodies, we have to create forms of speculation, okay? Because we don't, we're never gonna know what happened to these people. So how do we even imagine their lives? And De Leon says, we have to create improvised ways of knowing, okay? We have to 
sort of speculate and you know maybe you know resort to bizarre possibilities to find out what could have happened to them and i'm going to show you a short clip but um I started really thinking about this ethnographically and archaeologically, and and in the last summer I really started to think more about um, those who do not make it across the desert, and thinking about how can forensic science help me to understand this very hidden, um, deadly process. Lots of people go missing in the desert, um, many more than have been counted um, as as dead, and I spend time in shelters talking to families about looking for a, a daughter or a husband. Um, occasionally, I've come across uh, fragmented human remains, like this this worn out pair of shoes associated with some human rib fragments that had been um, gnawed on by animals. Um, it was this and, a, and an, arm, an arm fragment. We know that we, we have speculated for a long time that the desert does a really good job of destroying people's bodies. But the problem has been that it's all been speculation because no one has done any systematic research on the actual process of decomposition. So last year, um, in the beginning of the summer, uh, I, I drew on previous forensic research uh, using pig carcasses as proxies for the human body to try to understand decomposition. I took some pigs, I dressed them up in clothes similar to what migrants would wear in the desert, and I put them into different environmental conditions and monitored them with um, um motion cameras. This pig here, we left out for, for three weeks. It sat there for about two weeks, basically decomposing relatively naturally, and then vultures showed up, um, about six or seven of them. So this is hour one of vulture arrival, and this is um, at the end of 24 hours. So things have moved incredibly far. Many things are completely missing. We went back and, and surveyed the area, and um, you know, um, important parts of the skeleton had just completely gone missing, including the, the identification and stuff that we had put into the pants. So really signaling that this stuff is disappearing really quickly, and it's difficult to, to recover uh, archaeologically. So I think there's something for me watching this, you know, profoundly bizarre of watching this pig's carcass, you know dressed in migrant clothing. But this is precisely the point that De Leon makes, because he says, basically, the state is counting on the fact that those who do not make it across the border, there's actually nothing, there's not going to be anything left of them, OK? So what happens to this pig carcass, you know, this is what happened to migrant, what's going to happen to migrant bodies. So, you know, this need for speculation, he says, the improvisation is all we have. OK, and so what I think is important that this, you know, this part of the prevention through deterrence is the message to migrants and their families that if you get lost in the desert, if you don't make it across, nobody's going to mourn you and you're simply going to be eaten up by vultures. OK, so, you know, for the families, you know, and the migrants, you know, this absence of mourning is actually, I would argue, the ultimate punishment. And so De Leon says, how do we actually tell the stories of those who do not make it across? Okay. And you saw in the picture with the vultures, there was a water bottle. So, you know, you know, he constructs these lives and the person who's, who was the owner of the water bottle, you know, didn't make it across. Okay. So he said, how do we even begin to tell these stories? And I'm going to show you two short clips. Okay. Now, of course, I'm gonna... OK, everything was fine so far. OK, then we try. Trying to understand undocumented migration. Uh, last summer, uh, the, the hardest thing I had to do was make a phone call and say, um, Marisol, I found her. She was the 41-year-old uh, mother of three whose body I uh, encountered in the desert. She'd only been dead about four days. To call the family and say, I was with her at, 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 in the end. Uh, we put a blanket on her to try to re restore some dignity in the desert. And my students and I sat for seven hours waiting for law enforcement to come and pick up her body and take her away. That was, that's was that been still to this day one of the most difficult things that I've ever had to do as a researcher and as a, as a human being. Marisol is one of about 5,600 bodies that have been recovered in the desert and in, in the southern border since 1998. So one, one of, of, of many, many people. And I'm going to argue that this number is actually quite low. With, uh, with Marisol's family, it was, um, I struggled to, to find something positive to say to them over the phone. You know, I'm, I'm calling to, you know, because I know that if, if my loved one had gone missing in the desert, I would want to know as much as possible about what had happened. And so when I picked up this phone and said, you know, I'm the person who found Marisol, and um, I just want to let you know that we, that we sat with her for a long time, that we waited, um, and uh, we, we got there before the birds could get to her. 
Uh, and you know, and for me, this really brought home the importance of the forensic research because um, I started the, the the pig project two weeks before we found her, um, and then when we came across her body, you can already see birds beginning to circle her. So I think that what Jason De Leon has just said, this is the ups, you know, the the sort of epitome of the prevention through deterrence, because the state is counting, basically you know, on the fact that that's going to be itself a deterrence, because when you cross the desert, A, you cross the desert at your own peril, B, when you die, nobody's going to mourn you. And the fact that, you know, as he says, the authorities did, you know, took seven hours to get there, you know, the implication is very much, you know, that you're counting on the vultures to do their job. So this is also an idea in the cemetery of the companionless, the idea behind having the cemetery near the dog shelter. So even if that didn't literally happen, the idea was, you know, these so-called traders are going to be eaten by the dogs. So this is an impossible, I think, ethical vac vacuum that the state creates by saying, we're not going to create ways of mourning these dead because they have turned themselves into road hazards or into, you know, carcasses in the desert at their own peril. So we're not going to mourn them. And so what I think is so powerful is that De Leon and his students sit there, you know, with Marisol in the desert and they become surrogate mourners. And all they can do is sort of put a blanket over her body. But in this makeshift way of mourning, you know, they become the mourners. They stand in for, the, for Marisol's biological kin. Um, and that's a way of resisting the politics of the state. So they create forms of mourning where the state has tried to prohibit, um, you know, these rituals. And my conclusion is this. I think that in all of this, there's very much the question of complicity and resistance, because all these signs, you know, in the California desert, um, you know, on the California freeway, Arizona desert, California freeways, but also internal signs like the Cemetery of the Companionless. They want to enlist us into their politics of border policing. They want to prohibit us from mourning these lives. Second, I have tried to argue that this is very much a transnational phenomenon. So far though, I've talked about the US and I've talked about Turkey. I have not said anything about Germany. So the question is, where does my own German location come in? I think, that Germany is very much at the heart of this discourse, because of course, as you know, there's Germany's infamous Flüchtlingsdeal, refugee deal with Erdogan. So, you know, Germany by erecting this fortress Europe, you know, and, and sort of leaving Turkey to keep, you know, the refugees there is very much implicated in this. So the undocumented migrants who were buried in the cemetery of the companionless were very much Germany's responsibility as well. So this is not something that we are exempt from in Germany. And you know, it has been said you know, increasingly that the Mediterranean Sea has now become the largest grave in the world. So then my question is, how do we look at these images? And in the idea of the Mediterranean Sea, I think there's the same idea of prevention through deterrence as in the Arizona desert. So basically you're saying, you're going to cross the sea at your own peril. If you die there, you know, nobody's going to mourn you because your body is literally going to be lost. So I think, and this is my last slide, you know, the solace of this um, exhibit, Hostile Terrain um, 94, is that it's a traveling exhibit. So it's really about all of us. It travels to all our locations and it makes, you know, it forces us to acknowledge our own complicity in this. So, you know, how do we look at these signs and how do we resist looking at these signs? So I want to end with an image that Jason De Leon uses. And he said, all these terrains have now become the land of open graves. And so the open grave is very much part of the prevention through deterrence because the bodies are going to be left out in the open. They're not going to be buried. And the idea is that the state is going to shame the migrants for dying in this way. But what Jason Denon says and what Shafak says is, you know, what is shameful is actually not the migrants, but the state 
that creates this absence of mourning. So I want to ask in closing, how do we turn the open graves into open caskets? Because an open casket ceremony, in that ceremony, you honor the dead, you honor the life. But in order to turn the open grave into an open casket, I think we have to look at ourselves looking at the dead, okay? We have to ask ourselves, do we really create ways of resisting the prohibition of mourning? And do we see these lives as people and not as sort of collateral damage in border crossing affairs and border policing? So I think we have to look very hard at ourselves looking at these questions. And I think that for me is the most painful, but also the most necessary. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Mita. That was a wonderful talk that has brought so many of the issues that we've discussed in the past two weeks um, and also in preparing um, the exhibition um, together. And I particularly like the way you've interwoven your own thoughts um, on the novel with uh, Jason De Leon's um, thoughts on the exhibition and mourning in particular. Um, I have a number of questions myself. Um, um, but uh, before I use um, my privilege of being the chair, I would also um, like to open the floor, of course. So um, everyone who's interested in raising a question uh, can either just raise their hand um, and ask the question themselves or also use the chat function and then I will read out um, the question. Um, is there already uh, someone who has a particular question for me to Uh, I don't see a hand raised now, so I will just, <laughs> as I said, use my own privilege. Um, yeah, thank you so much also for, for uh, including this transnational perspective. And um, you talked about the Mediterranean. Um, I was particularly uh, uh, intrigued by, um, by this notion of the water family in the novel that you've mentioned. And um, I mean, thinking of water, um, not least since the refugee crisis, this has of course become a symbol um, for the exclusion of migrant bodies, the unequal distribution of mobility, resources, et cetera. But at the same time then water, and I think you've alluded to that, is also the elements that kind of makes um, porosity, permeability of seemingly solid, solid objects visible in a sense. Um, and in, in the novel, it almost seems like it also has this function of like permeating um, various boundaries like life, death, loneliness, companionship, um, grievability versus dehumanization. So um, I was wondering, is there, um, beyond this, this notion of the water family, are there any other, um, is there any other use of water imagery in the text um, that you um, find interesting or as interesting as I find it now? Yeah. You know, thank you. I, mean, I think I'm, I'm very, very intrigued by your, your question because I think I've, I'm all, you know, I find myself thinking about water more and more because I think water is sort of the element of life, right? It, it's sort of, you know, it's the basic, um, you know, element of what makes life possible. So so I liked her punning on sort of blood being thicker than water and, and sort of asking about biological kinship, but also sort of elective kinship. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so, So um, you know, the only other, I'm, I'm trying to think of the novel. So, you know, since eventually they're, they're you know, throwing Layla's body in the Bosporus River. So it's very much also, and that's very much, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, obsessed with Shafak um, that there's the idea of the, you know, um, a, you know, the Asian part of Turkey and the European part. So, and in sort of water in between. Um, so there's very many different takes on, you know, like you're saying, right? On water as a boundary between mm -hmm. different spaces. Um, so I guess I was, you know, I, I, I'll think about it more, but I, you know, I think it's very intriguing to me because I think the Mediterranean Sea, when I look at it, like also in the photo on my slide, there's something so calming. I mean, the, the sea, the ocean is a beautiful space, but then it's been turned into a grave, right? Um, so that's very, it's just very disturbing. And I think how we react to these, uh, these images also. Um, yeah. Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, 
that was that was wonderful. Are there already any other questions? And you can, of course, also disagree with me. Oh, you know, good. I, yeah. All of you. <laughs> I don't I, see you, so I. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, maybe you could also, for now, um, just um, stop sharing your screen so that oh, yeah. we can see okay, everyone again. Stop it. <gasps> yeah. Now I can see everybody. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Julia Feist has a, has a question. Here we go. Thank you so much for this really fascinating talk. Um, I want to ask a question about the limits of mourning or the limits of narration of what narrative can do. Um, because it seemed to me some substrand of what you were saying is that the migratory condition is so tied up with death itself, almost doesn't get out of it in the novel as much as in, you know, the boats being pushed back onto the open sea um, in the Mediterranean as happens um, almost every day where people are state sanctionedly given back um, to the sea and, and meeting likely their death there. Um, in other words, how can we get out of this idea or is there is there a migratory condition that is not tied up to death in you know say any narrative you've encountered any other cultural examples visual examples i'm very curious about that yeah i mean i'm very grateful for this question because also when you're at while you're speaking I was, I was thinking actually my talk you know got to be much more about death than i originally sort of anticipated and i think i was you know part of that was sort of the burial politics and and sort of jason de leon's work but i think what i would stress um is that precisely what you're saying i think it's important to stress sort of actually the connection between the living and the dead. And, and so in Leda's novel, so that's the second part that I didn't get to, the friends actually, after they've you know put Leda's body into the Bosporus, they go back to her apartment and they live there with their uh, with her objects, you know, the objects that tell all these wonderful stories about her life, you know, her perfumes and all the things she loved. So it's very much a story of survival. So for me, you know, if you take the image of the water bottle, you know, actually that, you know, uh, Jason Dino has the water bottle and she, you know, um, Shafak has all these image, these objects. I think I would actually be equally interested in, you know, looking of, at of the objects that survive and of successful journeys across the border. And Jason De Leon has this other sort of story about how he realized that some of, you know, his friends actually, you know, have been taken back to Mexico and then succeeded in get coming back and he finds their backpacks and says you know let's play, you know sit sit down and play poker right so you know i think we have to look at both sides of the story and there's something so so i think i would focus very much on survival and i would and actually defiance of the authorities mm -hmm. and and for me that's actually as important because actually i think your point is really really important for me because otherwise we were reducing this whole migration topic to tragedy mm -hmm. And we're going to be apathetic then, right? So, so I very much, yes, I will add that to the. <laughs> it's so much in the word decomposition, also, I think, right. which, which you stressed, right? In the sort of, you know, deconstruction kind of sense, um, right. it composes something while it decomposes something. Thank you very right. much. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that wonderful question, also. Um, are there any other questions? Um, Chan, yeah. Hi, first of all, thank you so much. Oh, my video is not on. Now my video is on. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It's uh, very interesting. I'm from Istanbul and from the Asian side, and I used to cross the, uh, the sea more or less every day, twice to go to university or to go to uh, work. Of course, for us, it would not really mean uh, death per se, like it wouldn't have this dark connotation, but living in Turkey, it's not easy to escape from these types of uh, dark things. So uh, what I wanted to say is uh, more of a comment than a question. Uh, there, the, the relationship between water, migration, death, and lack of mourning, etc. Uh, there are two things that I would like to bring to the table. Uh, first of all, there's a film 
that was shot in 1998 called On Board. Uh, let me write it on the chat. On Board 1998. Uh, also deals with uh, actually the death of a prostitute uh, from a different angle where the, the, a bunch of people who are working on a, a boat who come to Istanbul and uh, they accidentally, according to them, uh, end up murdering a prostitute and they find it surprisingly easy to cover up. And I think this might be a good uh, way of complementing Elif Shafak's book, uh, considering the, the dates of production were 20 years in between. And also uh, there's another uh, small water border that generally escapes attention between Greece and Turkey. It's the part, uh, it's basically the only, only border crossing uh, that you are not allowed to cross by foot in Turkey. Uh, there are uh, armed guards waiting on both sides. And especially after the purge in 2016, that was also mentioned in your presentation, a lot of people tried uh, to escape to Europe by using that because the agency and the Mediterranean Sea were, uh, there was too much attention on that. So they figured uh, they could cross the river uh, by swimming. And unfortunately, most of them also ended up drowning. And uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, these crossings and are looking to expand the scope beyond the Mediterranean, I thought this might be an interesting point to have. Thank you so much. Okay, so I watched the film and actually I will email you later on. I'm very intrigued. I mean, also because I'm, you know, my Turkish is so bad basically that I'm not, for instance, be, I'm not able to read the media coverage of, of the cemetery. So, mm -hmm. and I'm also really, and because I think what you're saying is also wonderful because we're so used to looking at certain border crossings, but not at others. Um, yes. And there's, and I've been very much interested also in, you know, some of my colleagues in, in Mainz who are Turkish German, you know, they can't go back to Turkey because they've said things about the current regime. And so they've been meeting their family just there on the Greek side. So their families, you know, have been crossing, you know, legitimately because they can't meet in Turkey. Um, so it's, for me, it's a very, and they keep talking about this little stretch of there and they say, you can see Turkey from from here, right, from Greece. And it's very, I think it's become very fraught um, for like who can legitimately visit even. So even among some of my colleagues, right? So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I have Emma Weisenfels, Weisenfels on the list and then we have another question in the chat. Um, Emma, if you'd go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for this talk. I, um, as everyone else has said too, I really appreciated um, your time, the literature to um, on the ground field work that people have done. It's given me, I've been writing down names because the research, this is all very interesting to me now. Um, and uh, yeah, I had a question um, going back to just your opening slides with the signs, um, the uh, essentially the, oh, I'm sorry, the essential migrant crossing um, sign, as well as the immigration smuggling, um, essentially deterrence signs. Um, uh, it just got me thinking about, in one of our courses, um, I'm in the um, national and transnational studies program. And so in one of our linguistic classes, we were talking about linguistic landscapes and the impacts of, of certain words and terms and languages being used in physical spaces and signs. And so um, I just found it interesting then that um, not only how the desert and natural landscapes and the oceans provide hazards as well for people trying to cross through and um, navigate their way, but then also these kind of, I thought it was interesting looking at what you presented as a linguistic or discourse landscape that's presenting all these other hazards as well um, in painting this image that actually creates potential other dangers for people um, put into these categories or these positions. Um, and I was just wondering, because um, the, the deserts and some of the highways, especially I know out west in the US um, are of course can be very isolated as well, just as used of transit. So I was wondering um, 
have you found or encountered any work of other researchers or in your work of um, kind of resistance to the discourse landscapes as well, like kind of um, alternative signage or just perhaps graffiti or any anything like that or work being done to sort of, um, yeah, resist that that discourse landscape. Yeah, and thank you. So I'm, I'm very intrigued by your question also because I'm, I'm, I'm going to think more about the linguistic politics. So I my my own, I mean, the one woman that I started working with or, or whose work has been really important for me is Alicia Schmidt Camacho. I'll type it into the chat later. And she's, I mean, I, and because at Wuppertal, right? Leah Espinosa Carrillo, you know, because Birgit Spengler introduced me to her and she she's a literary scholar, Alicia Schmidt Camacho. Um, and, and, but she does wonderful work with literature and she actually combine and she says, how do literary texts resist these signs? Oh, thank you. Yes, and she's at Yale, and, and so she says, what can literature do is a form of language. Um, but also, she's been also engaging with forensic science, and, and she says, you know, for me, you know, I'm, I'm a literary scholar, but I'm interested in what the natural, you know, what scientists enable us to do, uh, and then what, what their discourse is. And, and I love what you are so in my own work, when I was a long time ago doing postdoc work in, in California, you know, the signs were everywhere, um, you know, these sort of beware of migration signs. And I, so what I tried to do is I looked at the mural art because murals next to the freeway were a complete counter discourse, right? Because they were the, about the biography of migrant lives that the signs elided. Um, and also I, I was in part of the talk um, that I cut and there was a sign and, and Katya Zakowski got me started on all these burial politics, so it's partly her fault. Um, there's a sign in, in, in Tunisia, there's this, another cemetery where just, you know, undocumented migrants just, you know, get killed and they, they're buried there. And there's a fisherman who just takes care of these graves. And there's a sign in four languages, four European languages, that says this is the cemetery of the undocumented. And so for me, okay, obviously that's not gonna be direct, that's not in Arabic, the sign, but it's in French, in German, uh, I think in Italian and in English. So what does that say and who is the audience, right? It's saying, these are your dead. And this fisherman is taking care of these graves that are not even graves, right? I mean, so I think, you know, I, I will now think more about what you said about language. And I, I think it's very much, you know, there should be like a linguistics project, very much, I mean, both in terms of translation and in terms of linguistic translation. So, so I'm very, yes, I think more about this. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you again for also um, showing us how literature offers a voice um, to these issues as well and can also play an important role in influencing and just opening our minds, like exposing these ideas to us. So thank you. Thank you. And maybe just as an addition to that, I, I just remembered um, since you asked about graffitis also, and Mita, you mentioned that in Alicia's talk that she gave um, in 2019 at the University of Wuppertal, where she talked about migrant states of exception, um, she also uh, showed a couple a couple of graffitis, um, and one of them, I think the one I remember the most, um, it was in Spanish, but the translation would be, there are dreams on this side of the border too. And um, that, that I found that very powerful. And it was also, um, yeah, she, she did a lot with the science. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you, you would find a collection of uh, graffitis even online. Um, yeah, and thanks. Um, we had a question in the chat, but I see that uh, Rika, you actually turned your video on. So I'm sure you wanna ask the question yourself, right? <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Banerjee, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I had a wonderful time. Um, I was wondering if you know anything about the Citizenship Amendment Act in India that what that happened sort of towards the end of 2019, um, which was yeah um, an attempt to sort of push Hindu to a nationalism further and discriminate further against the Muslims, that same old Hindu-Muslim war. Um, Unfortunately, because of yeah the pandemic, the protests and everything sort of died down. But there was a talk of these um, detention camps that were being built um, on outskirts of a lot of cities in Gujarat and such. Um, 
uh, on barren lands and, you know, like, yeah, these kind of camps. Um, fortunately, there wasn't much information that was made available to the public. But I was wondering if you, if you know anything about this, would you also say that this is, this can be seen as also like is tying in with our current theme of hostile terrains, uh, terrains today? Or would you, would you say that this is actually, yeah, it's, what, what, what would your take be on um, that aspect? Yeah, I mean, think I'm, I'm actually thrilled. I mean, I, because I, so, so just last, on Friday, like last week, uh, Frank Schultz and at Frankfurt had Anduti Roy, you know, Alex, you talk. were you there? Also, also wanted to, yes, I was there. And I also wanted to bring that in after Emma's comment. Um, Yes. Uh, because talking about symmetries and subverting, for example, these uh, signs, um, how in Ministry of Happiness, Anjum sort of subverts the, the symmetry, like she being a prostitute, uh, she makes a home at a symmetry, at a graveyard, yes. um, and reclaims. Yeah, so I was wondering if that also ties in with our discussion today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, so I, in part of this, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to be as obsessed with, with, with death and cemeteries as it sounds now but I think that I mean the, the Ministry of, of uh, utmost happiness would make a wonderful companion piece to Shafak and I think there I also really like what you're saying about citizenship because I think this is very much uh, tied into citizenship and then Katja Zakowski uh, I'm quoting her uh, she and Markus Janke have this idea of the citizenship of the dead so I mean, what is the discourse of citizenship in, in India? And, and as Arundhati Roy said, right, who is being deprived of their citizenship? Um, and this whole anti-Muslim, I mean, Hindutva is just, you know, it's just so, and, and the thing is like, you know, <laughs> I'm getting carried away, but, you know, because in Germany, I think, you know, this is Hindu fascism, right? And, and in Germany, the, the cover, media coverage has been very much, I mean, maybe sort of cautious, but not as outraged, you know, by Hindutva politics. So I think, you know, there's actually a, a very sort of, um, you know, problematic me media coverage also. But I, I really like it, what you're saying because I think it's about, you know, what extra legal territories and invisible territories are being created in terms of camps. And, and you know, so, so this is would tie in for me with the larger question about, you know, rights, you know, not just human rights, but citizenship rights. Um, and so this is very, I mean, it's, it's sort of ongoing and I would work with like colleagues from legal studies to talk about how this is even justified, you know, how do you legalize camps like that, right? And, and how, how can then writing resist this? And, and I think Orndorty Roy's idea of actually just living in a cemetery, right? Of an, as an outcast, you're halfway between living and dying, she says. So why not just make your home you know, on the graveyard. It's just a very powerful image. And it would actually speak to what Rafai said earlier. It's, it's a story of survival, right? It's not just, you know, the idea of dying, but also of defying the state and surviving all these, you know, mandates, right? So, yes. But Avi, you know, I would love to talk more. Yeah, thank you for, for this uh, question and the answer, of course. Uh, we have another one by uh, Silvia Schultermann. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for this wonderfully interesting talk. Um, I have a question about um, practices of land acknowledgements, um, specifically sort of the US-Mexican border, which obviously from a historical perspective um, didn't always tie in with this US notion of citizenship. And I'm just um, curious whether in, in your work um, on, on the question of acknowledging the dead, there's also sort of an, an, an equivalent to a land acknowledgement of the historicity of the specific space itself, whether that registers with some of the signs or maybe even in the literature itself. And I'm thinking, you know, not just the US-Mexican border, but um, following people like Anne Svetkovich's work, this is sort of a, one way of situating oneself always in relation to um, a certain object of study as you did from a transnational perspective in your talk. So if there's anything along these lines, I would be um, very curious to hear to hear more about that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually, now I'm actually shocked that I didn't, I should have, I mean, I was so focused on sort of US and Turkey that, you know, I think what is so important about what you're saying is that this, I mean, going back all the way even to Gloria Andaldua's work, right? You know, the borderlands, uh, you know, the fact that it's now become a territory that's been so policed you know, it used to be part of Mexico anyway. So, so the shifting borders, 
you know, are, are just, you know, and, and sort of, you know, I guess I would start by saying, you know, how abortion is themselves historically contingent um, and, and sort of how is that, and, and plus, so for me, you know, that's been some time ago, but I, my, you know, earlier work was on Jose Saldiva's um, work on border politics and Tijuana is this sprawling space that actually, you know, where's the border, right? So, so I think this is a very sort of artificially drawn border and actually cultural signification. And maybe that's where sort of literature would come in. This is a, a borderless space actually, right? And so I think the separation would, is completely artificial. And what kind of communities is it actually keep, keeping apart? And, and what I um, like about Jason de Leon's work is that he has this idea of, you know, the borders are perpetually being crossed, right? I mean, people are being deported, but they get their backpack back on and just keep trying because this whole idea of sort of, you know, separating borders uh, is itself an arbitrary one. But also then for me, the idea would be, so that's very seductive in cultural terms, right? That this is all one vast cultural space, but then the politics of sort of uh, precarity in Mexico and Latin America, you know, the circumstances, I think, you know, this is work that I would like to do more about. So what are they fleeing from? And what is the material, also going back to material studies, political studies, you know, democracy studies, is, is what are these people, what are migrants escaping from, right? Um, and I, yes, so I, I think for me, that would actually be an area that needs to be integrated because otherwise we're gonna, like you're saying, we're going to be a historical, right? Unless we take this, the concrete space um, into account, right? Yes, so thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? We still have a lot of time. Um, yeah, Mark, please go ahead. I mean, first of all, I really have to be absolutely wonderful. We, you know, to hear you speak, uh, you know, to give us this amazing talk, Mita. I'm very grateful for that. But also, um, you know, how this um, multiple interaction works. Um, you know, um, Katya Zakowski has been quoted. You know, our um, former chair in American Studies, Jason De Leon, was here. Um, he's been quoted. Silvia Schultermandel, who's coming to Münster, you know, is in the audience. And our wonderful MA students, you know, went to Frank Schulze Engler, you know, who had invited Arundhati Roy. So all these, you know, connections, you know, are, are thrilling. Uh, so I just wanted to um, just say that first. Um, Mita, what I loved, um, so many things about your talk, but what I thought was really intriguing is um, that you want open graves to be turned into open caskets so that, you know, the, what, what you have called the policy of the state in a sense in the singular because you're quite right you know this is not unique uh, to the us american border or um to uh to turkey um this is um this is an intriguing idea and coupled in particular with what you have been saying um that it involves uh, you know us you know the we the reader the spectator somebody who goes to the um, exhibition. I mean, you, your entire talk makes me think you must have been there for the last two weeks because it was so in tune with, you know, with the stuff that we've been thinking while putting it up in the whole last year while, you know, while planning it. So, so many of these thoughts, you know, what do you do as an individual? What do you do as a group? You know, what is the significance of these toe tags? It's, it's just a little bit of cardboard. But you know the emotions that are felt by the volunteers as they fill them in, or the volunteers as they're putting them up on the map. Um, now we're thinking, what happens if we take them down? You know, this wall cannot stay in the Bible Museum. You know, they've lent us this space for for two weeks, but you know, clearly it's got to be removed again. So what's appropriate now in terms of what happens afterwards? And so in that sense, it was really. Uh, important, I think, also theoretically, you know, the, the way you involve the reader and say, you know, it, it makes a, a difference, you know, what readers, consumers, spectators do. But I also think politically speaking, of course, it's not just the state, because the, the policies that um, we're critical of, they do happen in our name. Um, so prevention through deterrence, that's the official name of this American policy. But at, at, as you said already, you know, um, the EU 
doesn't call it that, but it seems to have a very similar policy at its heart. And, you know, um, uh, Angela Merkel looked pretty good when she said, yes, we can, and Germany took in, you know, refugees. But at the same time, this deterrence, this logic, this cruel logic of deterrence um, is embraced by Germany and, and many others. In fact, recently now, uh, Europe is accused of putting, pushing boats back into the water. So it's not just letting people drown and not rescuing them if they rescue themselves, you know, you, you push them out again. So I'm, I'm really just coming around to saying Jason de Leon's idea of the desert as a killing machine that doesn't just kill migrants, but then also dispose of the body. There is that analogy to the Mediterranean, to the Atlantic, to the uh, Aegean as well, as, as Jeanne has pointed out, and some of, of our students had also pointed out um, last year, we are, I think deliberately, using these natural spaces and incorporate them into policies that are either official policies or, you know, unspoken and unofficial policies. And the cynicism is, as that sign, you know, that you began your talk with in, uh, in California, you know, we're, we're putting the decision back on the migrants and we're saying, well, you know, if you enter the water, if you enter the desert, who are we to help you, right? And, but this is why I'm saying this is being done in our name. And so it is up to us to say, we don't want this it done in our name. It's inhuman, it cannot go on. And so I think we do have to act, actually think, you know, what can we do to stop this? Because by, you know, not condoning it is not enough, right? So I think one has to actively protest and try and stop it. And it seemed that even this, you know, the visualization that the um, exhibition in, in Münster does has spoken to people because people would stand there and when you, you know, meet them, they say, oh my God, all these people, I never realized. Although, of course, we all realize. Um, uh, in, in Münster, they displayed um, Dutch NGOs work, all the names of people who drowned in the Mediterranean. It's, it's 10,000 at the moment and the list is 40 meters long. So there are ways of, of making this felt and making this known, but one has to go further. And I think your reading of the novel shows, you know, that even, you know, a literary text can help us go further. But so many of us are either students or work in universities. So, you know, there, there are so many people we're in touch with all the time. And I think we do need to become active, actually, you know, also in that political sense. I realize I haven't really put a question now, but I think I should <laughs> probably hold it so and leave it as a comment, actually. I'll answer it anyways. I mean, I think that, that what, I, you know, I think what I love about how you've described it is, is that two things. One is that where does the story even begin? So as literary scholars, we would say, when does the no novel open, right? So the story, where would it begin? And it would actually begin with the circumstances we're creating. I mean, so this is a global responsibility, right? So the circumstances that we are creating in the global South, okay, this is our responsibility. So, so it's about what story came before migration, right? So I think, and, and this is much more difficult to tell, I think it's much more complicated, right? So for me, that would be an important question for us as sort of literary scholars also to say what, what stories are we even um, asking, right? And, and then for me, you know, the, the disturbing thing about this is that I've, so when I talk, so when I talk, I'm here and, and we all agree, I'm very happy. So I gave two talks, one at the, at the Rotary Foundation in, in Mainz. I give my talk and people are like, there's like no reaction. And then the, the chair said, okay, let's close the, I mean, I, I, I think there's no need for questions. And because they were like, obviously what I was sort of taken for granted, okay, I said, okay, we have enough to share, okay. And obviously that wasn't sort of, you know, shared by anybody, I mean, that, that idea, right? So I'm very much thinking also about the audiences that we reach or do not reach, right? And these are all nice people, but, but they were like not halfway as convinced as me you know, of, of open open borders, right? And then second, I even gave this talk or a similar, you know, one about sort of fortress Europe in, in the um, economics faculty. And then these students, I mean, they said, well, we don't, why should we share? That's not in human nature to share. 
And I said, well, there's studies, there's primate research, right? Studies done with apes. And it says it shows that apes share, right? They they actually, you know, pull their bananas and then they, so I say, there's not obviously not a biological argument here, right? So I'm actually, what I'm shocked about is that when does a certain affect just people don't feel that, right? They will look at the statistics, but since what is closer to their, they think their biology is that we can't share, we have nothing to share. So, and for me, so what I'm disturbed by is like the audiences that we don't reach actually. And I, I can't even, you know, I'm just, I would be happy <laughs> for suggestions because the, like certainly so far the talks have backfired, um, you know, cause I wasn't able to reach anybody or convince anybody. Um, so, so I think for me, that's why it's so disturbing, right? Um, yeah. But I mean, academic talks, sorry to come back, but you know, academic talks, are, are perhaps different in that way to an exhibition or to a novel. I think your talk actually today shows, of course, there's a lot of affective power that a talk, an academic talk can possess, but as you've implied, it depends on the audience. If the audience is not receptive, they'll say, well, that's your opinion, you know, thank you, and, and that's it. Um, and what you're saying about open borders, about porosity, about sharing, it connects so well with this notion, you know, in the US we speak a lot about white privilege, but it's not just about white privilege, it's, it's about northern privilege, it's about European privilege. So these borders, whether we like them or not, of course they protect our status quo, and we can say we're open to sharing, but we don't have to share, right? So the, the way we live, the way we operate is dependent upon, you know, this deterrence and this, um, you know, reduction of poros porosity and the, the, you know, the moderation of migration. So I think politicians feel they're acting in the interest of the majority. So it's quite hard to speak up and say, no, you know, we want something else because it would make, it would really mean something, right? It would really make, um, a difference. And that, I think, is coupled with using, a, a, you know, apparently natural spaces to do this work. You know, you can't blame the Mediterranean for people drowning in it. It's in the nature of an ocean. You can't blame the desert for killing people. It's what deserts do. You can't even blame the birds because they're vultures. This is what they do. But it is nevertheless cynical because we, of course, we have the capacity to make the Mediterranean much safer than it is. We decide, you know, to arrest captains of, of, of rescue vessels rather than having more rescue vessels. So, you know, it's, cynical. it's not, as you were saying, you know, to say sharing is not in human nature. It's like saying, you know, stopping people drowning in the ocean is unnatural. It's not unnatural. It's unethical not to do it. So, you know, we do have arguments, but one needs to, you know, act, uh, you know, whatever that means exactly. But I think the, the, the effective work of sort of making a difference in terms of people feeling it is up to, you know, each and every individual, you know, um, everybody can make a difference. I think that's quite, quite an important um, lesson I've learned with this, with our, you know, tiny project that ties into this larger project, that you reach, you, you touch people in a different way with this type of work. So it was very different to classroom work or conferences, because it did reach people in Münster who are between the market and the bus stop, and they come, they wouldn't come to a talk necessarily, but they, you know, they have a look at the Bible Museum. I better stop. <laughs> Um, thank you. I think that was a wonderful uh, conversation. Um, yeah, I, I was also fascinated by the affective dimension that you basically brought up with the, with the concept of mourning in your talk, but that we could also see in the exhibition. And um, um, just the other day when I visited the exhibition, it was exactly that. I was very fascinated by Annika Riketat explaining to a parent and their child, I think, um, who had just stopped by. And um, you could really see that um, they were touched on an emotional level and also then started first asking about other events that happen, so the lecture series, but then also um, what can we do? And Annika did, a, did an awesome job explaining what the exhibition was all about. Um, but um, I think those are the rare moments where we kind of come out of our bubble, so to speak. Um, 
in a sense. Um, I think uh, we also have one more um, very interesting, it, I think it's not so much a question than it is um, a comment, but I think it's wonderful. It's by Anya Keil, also one of our um, MA students. And she uh, also says, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Your note on the reader being the companion to every undocumented migrant gave me a whole new perspective on other literary works, such as Mosin Hamid's Exit West, in which invisible doors represent invisible borders, but invisible to whom? I think your imagery of science perfectly works here by telling us what our nation um, nations slash governments want us to see and not to see and reshapes the role of the reader as the only companions very fascinating um. and, and thank you i mean i i sorry i have one one thought about what you just said and mark just said i mean i think what i love about also with the exhibit okay so i think it's really maybe that's what art and exhibits can do is that they can defamiliarize us with the discourse because it's so surprising, right? And I'm working in this sort of narrative medicine program, and they say that you know literature opens up unexpected spaces. So it's not the discourse we're used to. So it's not just border policing, it's not refugee crisis, but it tells stories, right? And so I I love this, you know, how sort of you know visitors would come into the exhibit, right? And they would be intrigued because they can't make sense of the exhibit at first glance, right? And I think that's a wonderful opportunity to tell different kinds of stories. So I think this is what I think, so you're making me more hopeful. And next time I go to Rotary, I'm gonna, you know, I have another, they're giving me another chance, uh, I think <laughs> in the summer. So so it, it's about defamiliar, right? Like shocking them into recognition, right? And I think for me, affect has been you know, at the core of what I'm trying to do, right? That that we have to look at unfamiliarizing the discourse because we're so, I mean, I you looked at the sign all the time and it never struck me. I mean, it struck me as weird or something, right? But, you know, what is beneath that is sort of, you know, I think much more complicated. So I, yes. So I want to come to Munster and see the exhibit. It's not too late, right? Well, <gasps> It's going to be on Sunday, the last day, so you have to come really quick. Okay, um, are there any other questions? Okay, if that's not the case, um, then I would like to thank you, Mita, again, for your wonderful talk and thank the very you. insightful discussions. Um, and also everyone who asked a question, I think that was wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you again. I'll also <laughs> clap my hands. Um, and I think um, Mark already hinted at the fact that the exhibition will uh, stay open until Sunday. And I'm sure you and Annika would like to say a few words again. But um, thanks again. And thank you so much for the wonderful discussion and for having Well, thank you, um, Mita, for actually taking up this invitation. It's not as though you're not on Zoom already all the time, you know, so it really is appreciated. Um, that, you know, that you took on this extra um, work and, and gave this super inspiring talk. I can see I'll be talking to students about this for the next two or three weeks in, in all my classes. It's really, um, really, really great. Um, and Annika um, is also in the room, Annika Rekatad, um, co-organizer of the exhibition. Um, yeah, we just wanted to um, say that with Amita Banerjee's talk, the um, series of lectures has come to a close and I like the way different disciplines came into it and really generated quite distinct perspectives. It's so even when, you know, we listen to um, Jesper Redich, who's also an Americanist and Mita, you know, you still get a, a completely different, you know, it's, it's not the same perspective in, in, in any way. It was such a rich two weeks, just in terms of the, um, the talks. Um, but as uh, Leah just pointed out, um, we have taken the decision to at least have the exhibition on for two more days. So we, you know, the weekend will will still be, uh, it'll still be there. It will be lit uh, until 9.30 in the evening. Um, but then on Monday, it'll be taken down. We're not yet sure what will happen exactly. We'd like to salvage fragments, but we're not sure how that's even um, going to work. Um, it's been uh, quite an experience. And I think 
especially so also for Annika Rekutat, who's writing her MA thesis um, on the project. I think by now, Annika, you, you're probably writing a book about it and, and not just an MA thesis. You have so much material <laughs> and so many more um, ideas. Do you want to also um, address our audience at this point? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, Mita, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And I, I took so many notes. And um, for example, I was very much interested or am now very much interested in the idea of surrogate mourners. And um, so when I first saw a picture of the exhibition online over a year ago now, I couldn't really comprehend what it meant. I knew that these totex represented migrants who died trying to cross the border. But after having worked on this exhibition for over a year now, after having um, heard all of these talks uh, over the last couple of days, I now see so much more uh, when I look at the Totex and at, at the exhibition. And I see, I see the exhibition as an act or as something done and achieved by surrogate mourners. And so we have repeatedly um, engaged with the question whether the Totex can actually encourage grieving and mourning because they, what they provide is only very limited information on the person uh, that died. And so our question was, can this really create a connection between the person filling out the Totex or watching the Totex? And I think what the idea of circuit mourners does for me is to make me aware that grieving is something more than just something private. It can, it can be an act of resistance and it is an act or it is the readiness to acknowledge our complicity. And so grieving is not only private, it is political. And this is something that I really hope people take away from the lecture and from the exhibition. And so this was one point that I wanted to make. And also um, I, I wanted to uh, comment on what uh, Leah said about how she witnessed me talking to some of the visitors. And this really was one very rewarding experience for me because um, while the exhibition is actually constructed to be very participatory, to engage with a lot of people in person, the current situation of course has, has made this almost impossible. So these very rare and few moments where we really can interact with the, uh, with the visitors or the volunteers, I cherished them a lot. And it was really great talking to them. And uh, one of the visitors said exactly uh, what's been mentioned before that, or what you mentioned, Mita, that art can open up these new spaces where, um, yeah, where we, experience politics differently and with with a new perspective and yes i think this is really what hostile terrain um can can do and has managed to do in minster and yes so there are still two two more days left where, where it can be visited and yes all i can say is uh, thank you so much to all the lecturers and all the volunteers. And, and thanks so much to you, Annika, you know, because we all know, you know, you had this idea first and then you spoke to various people in Münster. So you have had an, an, an effect on all of us. But, and I think that has also worked affectively, right? You, it wasn't just an intellectual argument you put forward, but somehow there, there was an energy that you um, possess and possessed at that time already, and that caught on. So I think even in individual interactions, you know, there, there, there is space um, for that. And while you were um, summing up just now, I was thinking um, that, yes, there is this effective potential, as Mita has described it, you know, roping in readers as, as surrogate mourners. Um, so novels clearly, or cultural artifacts clearly have that um, power. The, the exhibition, in a sense, also did something um, like 
change, uh, you know, defamiliarization was something uh, Mito spoke about. So it defamiliarized this, this space that we know, right? This used to be a car park, then it's been revamped and we have a Richard Serra sculpture in there. Nobody looks at it, you know, nobody realizes, you know, this is major. And then they've got that, you know, pretty nice uh, space in the Bible Museum, it doesn't get used very much. And now it's sort of become a gallery and people, you know, look at it differently. And I think like after you've read a novel and you see the world differently, you become optimistic, you think change is possible. This is also what's represented, you know, by making this room look so different. You know, one can collectively, as you said, with all the volunteers that have helped us, all the students that, you know, took the class, etc., you can change something. We can change our minds, but we can also change, you know, the way Munster looks in this particular place. And that change, although the exhibition will come down, but that change will um, uh, stay in, in our minds. Uh, Katarina just uh, in the chat wrote to me, you know, the meters topic, they will stick in her minds, you know, water and morning will stick with her for a while. So, you know, this is what happens, you know, um, whether it's thoughts or actions, you know, that can, a difference can be made. And that is, uh, at least potentially, um, you know, a political act. And it's, it's important to not belittle that, you know, the, the work that each and every one of us uh, does and uh, has the potential to do, I should say. Uh, we can't all write novels, you know, we can't all, you know, we're not all artists, say, uh, but, you know, Annika Rekitat, you know, inspired all of us to do this work. So, you know, your inspiration, Annika, was, was crucial. And look, you know, how much has happened in that, you know, last year or 18 months. So again, thank you very much to all of you, to Leah, uh, and Mita, of course, but you know, to Annika for uh, you know being at the at the core of this. Thank you so much.